to chapter 14. I'm going to do two problems. I'm going to do problem number one and problem number five. So let's look, let's look at problem number one. Problem number one is much more computationally intense than problem five. So it's good to start with problem one. So the chairman of the marketing department of a large state university undertakes a study to relate starting salary after graduation for marketing majors to grade point average. Now, from the way that this is set up, we know that the grade point average is going to be the independent variable. The main reason we know this is because grade point average happened in college, and the starting salary after graduation happens after college. And the independent variable always comes first. So there's the data. Connect was very nice to give us a nice little plotted line here. Uh, first step, find B1 and B0. Okay, we've got some options on this. Let's go over to Project Scarlet to see what's happening here. Let's go down to Statistical Inference. Actually, I actually want to click on this down here. And we've got some options we can look at linear regression. And we need to calculate B1 and B0. So this is going to show us the formula and step-by-step -step ways of calculating B1, and this one up here will do for B0, so let's click on B1. Walks us through what's happening, gives us some data, information given from the data, and so that we can go in from there. We can also ask it to show us the formula. Here's the formula for B1. It should look very similar to the formula in our book. It also shows us the solution. Starts out with the formula, plugging in the information we're given, which is x bar and y bar. Remember, x bar is the sample mean of the x's, and y bar is the sample mean of the y's. And then it expands this according to the summations into this monster formula. And then from there, it's just algebra, simplifying each of the quantities inside the parentheses multiplying the quantities, the quantities that are multiplied together first, and then adding all of those quantities together. And for this data, we get a negative 0 0.7309 for our B1. And there we go. It's more interesting if we hide the solution and just work based on the uh, data given. We can also practice finding the OLS estimate of the y-intercept, B0. Same idea. Here's the data. Here we're given x bar, y bar, and B1. And we've got the formula. If we don't remember the formula, if we want to see the solution, we can work through the solution here. Formula, substitute, simplify. The R code's not going to be helpful for us because we don't use the R statistical environment. So if you want to have practice on calculating this beta naught and beta uh, B naught and B1, this is a place to go. Let's see if we can do this B naught and B1 in Excel. So let's go ahead and open Excel. There's Excel. Now the first step is to take the data and import over into Excel. Let's see if I can copy and paste. Looks like I'm going to be able to. Control V for paste. I'm going to clean some things up. We don't care about the identifier. So this first is going to be the GPA. Second is salary. Copying and pasting is always rather difficult at times. We want to make sure every number, every word is in its own cell. Looks good. And now let's calculate B1 and B0 using Excel. First, remember GPA is X. It's going to be important to know that. So I'm going to highlight the data. 
Then I'm going to go into the insert. I'm going to insert scatter plot. Oop. There's a scatter plot of data. GPA is along the x-axis. Looks like GPA is along the x-axis here. Starting salary along the y-axis. Let's get, actually get the x and the y-axis listed. So this is going to be GPA. This is starting salary. Yeah, don't like those. Main difference between, or one of the differences between what we have in Excel and what Connect gave us is Connect only runs on the y-axis from 26 to 38. Let's go ahead and fix that here. I'm going to click on the y-axis values. I'm going to right-click now. I'm going to go into the Format Axis. When you do that, this pops up. We've got some axis options, the minimum. We're going to fix that at 26. The maximum, we're going to fix that at 38. I think that's all we need. Major units, we don't want the major units. And close. That looks better, but notice the GPA here runs from 2 to 4. Here it runs from 0 to 5. Let's go ahead and fix that. Click on the axis, right click now, format axis. Format axis box pops up. I'm going to run this from 2 to 4. And we're going to set the major unit at 0 0.5. Now it looks much closer to what Connect gives us. I think it's just a tad bit smaller. Ah, Connect gives us the starting of the fitted line. Let's go ahead and get Excel to give that to us. I'm going to right click here in the table. I'm going to format the plot area. This isn't going to give us the line, but it's going to make things a little bit cooler. Some things that I can do. I can choose the fill color. I'm going to change the fill color to gradient fill. I can change the border styles. I can get shadows in there. I don't like that fill color. Let's make it a pattern fill. No, that doesn't work. Solid. Let's make it filled orange. That looks awesome. Okay, now let's get that line up there. Go up to Format. Layout. This is where we want to, where we want to be. Design. These three chart tools are going to give us everything, get, allow us to do anything we want to those charts. So, clicking here, you see that you can change the dots rather easily. You can change the style or the chart layout rather easily. Select a new data. We can move the chart to its own sheet. Over in Format, we can do similar things. We're going to go to Layout. We're going to add a trend line. It's going to be a linear trend line. Okay, it looks like that line matches that line. We can make that trend line a little bit wider, so I'm going to right click on it. I'm going to format the trend line. Format box comes up. Line style. You can change the width. You can change the color. And there we go. We are missing something. We're missing the actual formula for it. See if it's in format trend line. Yes, it is. Display the equation on the chart. If you want the R squared value, you can also select that. That's not a part of the question, so we're going to unclick that. So here's the equation of the line according to Excel. Here's the equation of the line according to Connect. Excel gives you a couple extra digits, then Connect. No major difference between the two. So that's how you will get the line of best fit in Excel. But really, we don't need that. Because all we have to do is interpret what information is given to us. V1 is the effect of X on Y. That's going to be the 5.967. Around these three decimal places. 
This means that for every one increase, one full point increase in GPA, the starting salary is going to go up by 5.967, probably $1,000 per year. B0 is the y-intercept, it's 13.90. Oh, but wait, we're supposed to round it to three decimal places. This only gives it to two, and now it's pop up Microsoft Excel. It's 13.901. See, there's a reason we did this in Excel. 5.967. 13.901. Now the b uh, the the y intercept this b naught is the value of x uh, the value of y when x is zero. So if a person's GPA is zero, then the predicted starting salary is thirteen point nine zero one. Now this is important. It does not make sense at this level to estimate values of y for values of x outside what we have, we've observed. So here we've observed values of x ranging from 2.22 to 3.82. Estimating y given an x value outside that range doesn't make sense. So estimating y for an x value that's 0 doesn't make sense according to the model because we don't have information that low in terms of GPA. Interpolation, which is estimating Y values based on X values in this range, is fine. Extrapolation, which means estimating Y values for X values outside this range, is not fine. So you should only be using this model to estimate starting salaries when the GPAs are between 2.22 and 3.82. So the interpretation of B0 is the starting salary sum with a GPA of 0. The interpretation of B1 is that for every increase in GPA of 1, the mean salary goes up. And we know it goes up because this B1 is positive by 5.967,000. No, the interpretation of B0 does not make practical sense. Again, it doesn't make practical sense because we don't have any uh, GPAs that are close to zero. And this model is only really good for GPAs between 2.22 and 3.82. And last but not least for this problem, y hat. y hat is the predicted value of y given the value of x. Here we got a value of x of 3.25. 3.25, it's going to be somewhere around here. We want the value on the line because the line gives us all the y hat values. We want the value on the line corresponding to x equals 3.25. So let's pop up Excel. For given x is 3.25, we want to know the value of y or the predicted value of y. So this is just going to equal 13.901 plus 5.9671 times x. Let's take this 3.25, the value of x that we're given, stick it in the linear equation for x, solve for y. 33.29408. I've already forgotten it. 29408. Round it to five decimal places. Interesting. Since we are only able to estimate GPA to two decimal places, in reality we should be estimating y hat to two decimal places. It's that whole significant figure thing we got back in high school.
but Connect asks us to do it to five decimal places, and so we're going to do it to five decimal places. So here's problem one. We took the data, we put it into Excel, we created our scatter plot. On the scatter plot, we had Excel give us the line of the best fit, and then give us the equation for that line of best fit. We interpreted what V1 and V0 meant. We decided that it did not make sense to interpret V0 because there are no GPAs anywhere close to zero. And then we estimated Y, the starting salary, for someone who had a GPA of 3.25. That's problem one. And here's problem number five. We're given the results from the ANOVA table for regression, and we're trying to, we have to interpret that table. Interpretation and pulling off important numbers. So use the explained variation and unexplained variation of computer output to calculate the F model. It's right there. 0 0.11, that's the F value. Utilizing the F model statistic, which we just got here, and the appropriate critical value to test beta, beta 1 equals 0 versus beta 1 equals not 0 by setting alpha equal to 0.05. To do this, we go to the table in the back of the book. It's in Appendix A, where all the statistical tables are. It starts on page 795, but we note that the pa uh, table on page 795 is for values where alpha is 0 0.10. We see that at the very top of the page, or I guess it's the left-hand side of the page. It says an F table colon values of F sub 0.10. We need the one that's an F table colon values of F sub 0.05, which thankfully is the next page, so 796. Notice how the table is set up. Across the top is DF1, the numerator degrees of freedom. The numerator degrees of freedom here are going to be 1 that's the degrees of freedom for the numerator in calculating this F statistic. Remember how this F statistic is calculated. It's the ratio of the first mean squared to the second, the numerator mean squared to the denominator mean squared, or the regression mean squared to the error mean squared. I guess we're calling it residual here. So we look for D1 of 1. D2, denominator degrees of freedom, are going to be the degrees of freedom corresponding to the errors or the residuals. There's 10 of them, so we go down to 10. 4.96 is going to be the critical value. 4.96 is the critical value. Because 0.11 is less than 4.96, we fail to reject. no evidence of a significant relationship between x and y. C. Utilizing the F model statistic and the appropriate critical value for probability by setting alpha equal 0 0.01. Okay, we've got to change tables now. The table on 796 is for 0 0.05. On page 797 it's 0 0.025. And 798 is 0 0.01. Okay, so we're going to use the table on 798. Again, degrees of freedom numerator are 1. Degrees of freedom denominator are 10. So the critical value is 10.04. So again, do not reject because the observed test statistic is less than closer to zero than the critical value. So we do not reject with no evidence. P, find the p-value value to f model. That p-value is given to us, 0.7432. So we reject alpha at the none of these levels because none of these alphas are greater than that p-value. There is no evidence of a significant relationship between x and y. And that's it. Notice we did no calculations. 
we had to use the tables to get the critical values. But all the numbers, the F value and the P value, came off the table that was given to us. So in some ways, 5 was pretty easy. Now let's go ahead and submit this. I'll submit anyway. Got 8 out of 20. Got them all right. Now I do want to point out one thing, and this is going to be pretty important for chapter 14. Problem 5, where we just came from. Problem C, that not should not be there. The correct wording is blah, 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 of a significant relationship between x and y. It doesn't make sense to have the not in there. Period. That not is a uh, an error on Connect's part in terms of, of uh, English, of writing things. So that's the end. Hopefully this was in, uh, helpful. Again, problem five was interpreting the output. Problem one was creating the results using Excel, but beyond that, also interpreting what you got and estimating why when uh, when x is 3.25. Have a great day. Take care.